Today, I'm, I'd like to kind of introduce and kind of talk through some of the, uh, the uh, work which we've completed on this uh, project, which has been quite exciting and uh, really good to start to see great examples of people actually starting to actually design for, for, for excedence. Uh, this has been a Syria project, and uh, along with, 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 with myself, um, we've had Paul Hargreaves and Elliot Gill from uh, Halcrow, and also Richard Ashley from uh, Eco Futures and the Penn Arm Water Group uh, working on this. And we're very grateful to the project funders, uh, in particular the uh, Joint uh, Environment Agency DEFRA pro program, and also Wessex Water, uh, providing funding for, for the project, but of course also the project steering group, who provide invaluable advice and guidance along the way. So um, today, I'm just going to kind of touch on these kind of uh, key areas. So firstly, our drainage approach, and as David mentioned, kind of firstly about design standards. Then I'd like to kind of discuss about re recognizing exceedance rainfall events. And maybe we've, uh, we've kind of always thought about we have a design uh, standard, and then we go straight to, to extreme. So I want to kind of uh, help with our thinking on that. Um, talk a little bit about how we can make our areas more resilient and kind of do that through, through some examples and then pull out just some of the key things of, uh, about what makes a, a, a success. So I'll actually start with the uh, project. This, uh, this looked to actually build upon guidance which we completed in 2006, this uh, uh, good practice guidance document here. Um, but one of the things that we were quite aware of uh, over the last few years is that maybe the uptake uh, hasn't actually been as great as that we, we, as we would like. And so this project actually looked into actually understanding why that was actually hap hap happening so then that we could then provide information uh, to support practitioners and decision makers start to design more for, it, for e e exceedance. And one of the key things early on in the project from uh, undertaking surveys and from the workshops really highlighted was uh, about one third of the people who we surveyed had actually used the guidance, one third were aware of it but hadn't used it, and one third hadn't even heard of it. So I think the project to encourage the uptake of designing for exceedance is actually quite appropriate here. Uh, and so the project has look, looked to produce uh, a, a summary in terms of lessons and success factors and case st st studies and a summary report uh, which, as David mentioned, uh, you'll be able to pick up in hard copy at the end of the event. So I think a good place to start is to, for just to understand a little bit in terms of how we typically design drainage to different standards. Using rainfall return periods was shown here, kind of the probability of occurrence. And we have various standards for retrofit and, and a new development. So in terms of new development, we typically now kind of follow uh, the uh, national, um, the uh, MPPF, and uh, we might follow sewers for adoption, or as they come out eventually, the SUDS, the national SUDS st standards. And we typically look to ensure properties won't flood uh, uh, using a one in 100 year return period, or that 1% chance of occurring in any given year. In retrofit areas, we typically design sewers to maybe have a one in 30 year uh, level of uh, protection. But I think it's worth noting uh, that many of our highways, are the drainage design is actually to a lower standard as well, uh, which could be one in, one in five years, so 20% chance of occurring, or one in 10 year, 10% chance of occurring. But actually some of our older highways might even have designs to one in two, so uh, a 50% chance of occurring. So uh, depending on where you are, you can expect drainage exceedance to actually occur. So what is exceedance? Well, uh, we spent quite a lot, a lot of time trying to actually define what uh, exceedance was to us on the project. And so uh, we, we tried to capture it in terms of flow that is conveyed or stored on the surface uh, because the capacity of a drainage system carrying storm water has been exceeded. And that could be due to a, a blockage either within the drainage system or an inlet or, uh, uh, to the drainage system as well. Uh, and I think it's a very nice example of uh, flow running overland in St. Ives where the highways act as basically rivers uh, during uh, bigger, bigger, big events and really channel water uh, to uh, di di different points. So uh, 
I think a key finding from this project was for us, it was important for people to actually understand and recognize what exceedance actually is. And so uh, one of the things that we uh, came, came, came across during our literature re review was work done by Fettini uh, in 2012. And he used a rainfall to uh, impacts relationship to uh, help explain about the different types of rainfall and help understand the different approaches that we might take to manage rainfall. And we've looked to just develop this relationship a little bit further, and I'll uh, just run through this, 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 this now. Um, so in, in, in this relationship, as, as, as we kind of increase the kind of band uh, in uh, terms of the, in, the uh, impact, actually start, could, uh, could, could uh, start to increase. And so we've looked at those four domains here. And we'll start with everyday rainfall. So domain one, where we design drainage to manage probably pub, 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 public health impacts from very small everyday rainfall. Domain two is our, our design rainfall. So those design standards that I just mentioned a uh, moment ago. But what happens when we actually get above that, when that drainage capacity is exceeded? So I think previously we've often referred to it as being extreme rainfall. Uh, but we believe it's kind of actually worth noting that there's, a, there's this third domain, so exceedance events or exceedance rainfall, before you actually get to extreme. So we really do recognize that this happens. Um, we know it's an important requirement on new development to manage exceedance. Uh, unfortunately, we do see on some developments uh, we either manage everything below ground and then we don't have to worry about what might happen above, above ground, which is a little bit uh, <laughs> sad, really. And we see some very good practice and some very poor practice uh, on, on a, for, for new development design, particularly through the uh, project. But if you want to kind of join up uh, in, in terms of how we manage flood risk uh, for our communities and particularly beyond our drainage design standards, we think it's important that we do recognize that there is this kind of exceedance rainfall. We're not trying to define parameters around it, but just actually recognize uh, that it actually occurs. Because then after that, you get your extreme rainfall. And this is the fourth domain, and really this is here where you'd use your emergency response and maybe other kind of spatial planning to really actually look to actually manage that. And if we manage that, this whole continuum of uh, rainfall, then uh, with a very kind of joined up, 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 up approach, I think we'll actually end, end, end up with a far better way to actually manage flood risk. So what happens when drainage capacity is exceeded? Well, pretty obviously, these are, these are, these are some of the uh, impacts. But we then have some choices to make. Do we build bigger? But is it actually unsustainable and unaffordable? How, how much bigger can we build our drainage systems to actually cope with that? Do we let it happen? We accept it, uh, manage the consequence of, of, of the impact and just leave it to the emergency service providers and civil contingency? Or do we look to make our spaces far more resilient and design for exceedance? And seeing as you're all, all here today, it won't surprise you that I'm kind of advocating the last one of these. So, uh, the benefits of designing for exceedance. Well, it can be quite cost effective and also can actually uh, really improve the speed of delivery to provide some relief to communities. Uh, we, we saw an example in, in the top right here. This was in Dudley and the properties to the right were frequently flooding following kind of uh, development in the catchment uh, over, over time. And in, uh, in a phased approach to actually manage exceedance and, and the problem itself. We actually built a speed hump. You can actually see the speed up here and a grass bund. And that actually held water on the carriageway on the left to provide some relief to those properties un, 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 until uh, another scheme was, was able to be put, put, put in place. So it's only occasional use. So it's really making multifunctional assets or multifunctional infrastructure. So really making the most of, of what we have. I think one of the uh, other great benefits is it can really raise awareness of water and how we're actually trying to actually manage that. And uh, Gordon may actually touch on this. This is an image from Whitney, which is another one, 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 one of the case studies. And I won't steal Gordon's fund, funder who will uh, come and tell us about uh, Whitney in a mo moment. 
So how might we manage exceedance? Well, we've got the kind of the technical ways, uh, so we'll briefly kind of touch on them. It could be providing protection more in the top left around people's properties. Uh, it could be stopping water kind of getting towards properties in the uh, middle top. Uh, so some of these features are very similar to what we might do in terms of watercourse or river flood flooding as well. We uh, may design our highways to specifically accommodate exceedance flow. This is an example from uh, St. Blasey, uh, but I won't spoil any more thunder from uh, Charles Hill talking at the moment. Um, we may allow exceedance flow in the bottom left uh, to come down the highway and then specifically intercept it. But one of the things I hope that you'll be getting a sense here, we're choosing how we actually manage exceedance rather than letting it actually kind of manage, our, man, 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 manage us. In the uh, bottom middle, uh, this is an image from uh, Aston near Rotherham, where just introducing a drop curb directed flow towards a watercourse at the end of the footpath and not into the properties on the right. So very simple, that attention to detail, very, very, very critical. And then finally, having somewhere to uh, actually store water at, at, at times, which might be actually having both a, a, um, a park and open green, green, green space that we can then actually store water in at the same time. And this is an example actually from the United States. And for those of you who are at the back who probably can't read the sign fully, it says, keep out during rainstorms. So some... Some real examples of that I'll just kind of take you uh, through. Uh, so firstly, this is a, an example of a retrofit in uh, Aston. And in this part of uh, Aston, there's about uh, somewhere over 20 homes actually got, got flooded by rainfall kind of greater than a one in 50 year return period. So the capacity of the drainage system was well and truly beaten. And Rotherham Metropolitan Council, uh, sorry, Metropolitan Borough Council um, investigated and they surveyed the area. So they did a very detailed topographic survey to, although they understood where the water had gone, they wanted to make sure they understood all the flow pathways through uh, the, the uh, neighborhood here. And so what they uh, end, 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 end up doing, I'll just kind of go around clockwise from the top, top left, um, they reprofiled a footpath, which is a little bit hard to see, but believe me, they did, uh, which then takes water that comes from the grass bank uh, on, on, on the right, and that creates a channel to direct flow away from the properties on the left. That eventually comes to this middle image, uh, where previously the, uh, this was two car parks which was actually joined and there wasn't a, a, a gap there. They opened up a little gap to allow the water to actually come through, built up a grass bund on the left-hand curb as well to make sure water couldn't overtop and flood the properties on, on the left. This then comes down the highway, to this point here, uh, where they uh, put more gullies into the road so to, to actually take the water away, but then to make sure that then the drainage system here isn't exceeded, they then actually introduce an overflow, which then just discharges into this grassed uh, sunken basin here in a playing field, which then just when it occasionally operates, the water can then actually just soak away. An example from Dublin, uh, where the, uh, the Wad culvert uh, frequently flooded, and so they took a phased approach to managing exceedance here. Uh, in the top left, uh, the, uh, you can see which is where you've got this kind of circle area here in, in the picture on the top right, quite extensive flooding here. Um, but in a phased approach, they initially worked with the local community and worked with uh, the big homeowners to provide a route for water to get from the properties to the back of the gardens and out through these slots here into, into, into the golf course. So they, so they provided the route, but they had to do it by working uh, with the community, which was a real key aspect uh, to this case study. And then a far, final one, which, which I'll touch on today, is about managing uh, exceedance at Camborne Pool and Red Roof. And, um, to enable regeneration here to take place, we had a choice about well, either uh, upgrading the infrastructure uh, and assets to actually cope with the flow or to actually take surface water out of the combined sewer system. And, the, um, and they made the latter choice. And so very early from the concept stage, which is in, in the top left, they looked to manage uh, uh, the surface water through suds and specifically designed exceedance pathways. 
and that kind of carried through the whole development of the, of, uh, of the area to end up with uh, flow uh, pathways for the, the exceedance and places for that to then actually be stored. So what makes a success? Well, I think one of the uh, most critical things isn't necessarily some of the technical aspects. It's about actually how we work together. And there's three key areas which we've kind of pulled out from, from the work. So firstly, that's with disciplines. In the retrofit scenario, you, you may have less di disciplines. For example, you may have a, uh, at least a drainage engineer. You might have a highway engineer work, work working together. But actually understanding the risks of uh, and mitigating them to actually manage exceedance. In new development, you, you may have many, many other dis 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 disciplines come together. It might be architect-led, for example. And it's really then actually recognizing the important role of managing exceedance. And actually, with the different disciplines working together, creating quite a nice environment still to actually manage exceedance. Uh, so, it, so it doesn't actually look uh, aesthetically poor. Organizations working together is, is really critical. So bringing, bringing together, it might be the local authority, the water company, the environment agency, but actually just working together and overcoming some of the hurdles and bar barriers, and we'll, again, we'll, we'll hear a little bit about, about, about that in, in the next couple, couple, couple of presentations. But from bringing these or, or, or organizations together really works to uh, enable us to actually manage exceedance. And finally, and, and I think very importantly, communities. They can play a very big role, both in retrofit and in new development, in actually uh, both helping to develop the solution, obviously understand the, the uh, problem, and being part of the solution at the, at, at the end of it, because they're often the ones on the ground when it actually starts to actually happen. What else makes success? Well, attention to detail. So firstly, it sounds a bit obvious, but understand where the water comes from and where it actually goes. Uh, from a drainage background, that is quite a critical aspect. Um, but that is actually very important when we want to actually be able to actually manage it. Um, so it's about using the appropriate survey and modeling techniques. And over recent years, we've actually got far better, as long as we have good data, to be able to actually model and replicate and predict what will actually happen with water on, with, with, with water on the surface. And we have different levels. We have kind of very high level with the updated surface water flood maps from, from the Environment Agency. But then we can drill down into more detail with our drainage models uh, on top of that. And that's about designing the measures and locations to be resilient and safe. And so that attention to detail is first important to, uh, to understand where your water will, will go, but also to assess risks. And I'll, I'll just come back to that in a moment. Thanks, David. Um, creating spaces in places. So firstly, creating the space. Often it's about recognizing where you actually have that space, where you may want to pass water through. Uh, this is an example from a, uh, on the, in the top left, where a watercourse uh, inlet can overflow in Bodmin. And the water can actually come down a road and, and it's specifically guided to come through this gate and not the neighbor's gate, which is boarded off, and pass through properties. It's about having shared space. This is an example up in Sheffield, the uh, uh, Manor Fields development, which is both a uh, play area, playing field, but also acts as an exceedance storage, storage, storage area. It's about having multifunctional space as well. In uh, Torquay, uh, which has suffered some quite significant flooding over, uh, over, over the years, uh, Torbay Council have actually took a phased approach to managing exceedance here. Firstly, actually reintroducing curbs and a highway in the shopping area. And at first, the shoppers and the shop owners weren't exactly on board, but actually through engagement, actually talking to them and helping them understand why and understanding what the risks were, they then were able to actually um, get this actually built. And finally, as, as I mentioned, it's really critical that we assess and manage risks there's often real and very perceived risks that, that people bring to uh, designing for exceedance. So we need to be, we need to actually not try and shy away from, but actually exceed the wide range of risks from different sy 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 systems. And possibly using a framework like I ISO 31000 might actually allow us to actually do that 
to, to, to consider various different ele elements. So, um, next steps to encourage this approach. Uh, we've developed uh, various kind of reports in terms of a summary report, case studies and a lessons and success facts report, which, which you can pick up uh, from outside on, on your way out today, which really helps to uh, provide examples of where this has been done before. And there's lots of different contexts, so hopefully if there's a situation that you're looking to deal with, they'll be one which, which, which can align with your needs. And we've also undertaken quite a comprehensive literature re re review, uh, which is uh, posted on uh, the Sustrain web, web website, along with all, all of this material, and you can get access to the original guidance as well, if it's not reading that you uh, kind of uh, all, all re 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 ready go through. Uh, some recommendations. Well, uh, we kind of had three kind of headline recommendations. Firstly, around making it happen. Uh, which is really with local authorities and highway authorities and lead local flood of far, far, far authorities. And first is making the most of the opportunities that we actually have in uh, work that we're actually taking, take, take, taking place on, on the ground, as well as really kind of getting the developers to demonstrate how exceedance is actually managed on the development. Going a little bit further than just drawing an arrow on, on, a, on, a, on a plan, so we actually understand actually not just where the water will go, but actually how much water you might have to be able to manage. Encouraging the uptake. So uh, this was particularly around professional bodies, really actually encouraging their members, such as uh, at the ICE here, to really both contemplate and start to use designing for exceedance approaches. And also with lead local flood uh, far, far, far authorities through their strategic partnerships, really actually encouraging these approaches. And then finally, in terms of looking at strategy and policy and guidance and le le legislation, for the government to consider using the learning from this, this uh, pro pro project, um, and for institutions and stakeholders to maybe take another look at their own guidance and say, is it being clear enough around designing for, for exceedance? Do we need to be a little bit more explicit? So some final thoughts. Uh, Let's not miss the opportunities that we have to manage exceedance, whether in retrofit or in new development. Um, it's quite critical we, we know where exceedance occurs and where it moves over the surface, because once we know that, we can actually develop the infrastructure to, to actually cope with, 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 with that. We have a whole range of measures that, uh, we, that, that, that we can use, but we have to really create this multifunctional infrastructure and really go for the shared space approach. And to do that, we have to work together, whether it's disciplines, organizations, and critically uh, with communities, so that we can assess, mitigate, and manage the risk. And I'll leave you with uh, this image. Uh, this is one that I took in Pompeii, and any, any, anyone who's, who's been to Pompeii, um, perhaps if there is something that we can uh, still learn, uh, Pompeii roads were designed uh, like this. You've got the stepping stones to walk across. The roads actually drained all the surface water, uh, but they had the spacings, particularly between the stones, for the uh, cart and horse to carry on actually going through. That's maybe quite a good example of a shared space and a multifunctional use. Thank you very much. Um, Chris, I just wondered if you'd made any observations during your work about the longevity of some of these designing for exceedance schemes. I can imagine it would be quite easy that you carefully look at your scheme, put a dip in the curve just at the right point to let the flow away, and then next time someone comes on to do some maintenance, they go, oh, what's this? Clearly a mistake. Yeah. Put, you know, put it back in. Um, any thoughts about how you can ensure that these schemes last? Yes. I mean, I mean w one of the things which uh, came out from, from the Aston case st st study was uh, the need to be able to record down where you've made these uh, changes, uh, which can potentially be done under the uh, Flood and Water, Water, Water Management Act and actually recording where you've, you've, you've got these, particularly if these are actually quite cri critical. Because as you say, the last thing you, you want to do is to actually come and do some maintenance and change the drop curve back to a normal curve because someone cannot see why on earth you've, you've actually got that. So I think there is a the provision for us to actually do that. It's just making sure that we do record them actually down or that element of work down on an asset re re register. I think then the key thing is everyone actually having access to that, who needs to have access to, 
to it, maybe across departments, because it might be different departments who actually then end up actually uh, coming in to do, to do something at, at, at a later date. I wondered actually okay. whether you might want to have some sort of marking on the asset itself. Um, you know, for example, there's the, the yellowfish scheme, isn't there, next to drains that, so you can know that they drain to a river. Uh, you can perhaps have a water drop or something next to a... Possibly. And, I mean, one of the things that we've seen from around the world is when you actually do that, you actually raise awareness uh, of, of what's going on. I mean, it reminds me of seeing some, some of the symbols in Portland, for, for example, in, 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 in the US, where they kind of make it very, very clear uh, in terms of this being part of a particular scheme, and people then actually are far, are, 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 are far more aware. So we could have an exceedance mark, you're right. Thanks. Okay. You could have a notice which says road floods during heavy rain. I've seen that in one or two countries. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, I, I could just envisage the appendage will be, which will be added underneath. There's a question at the back there. Jenny Hill from JVA Consulting. Um, my question involves the um, exceedance um, rainfall return periods. So if you're designing your traditional drainage for say a 1 in 20 um, and then you're accepting that there's extreme events, say the 100 plus climate change on top of that, what are your exceedance events that you're then designing your overland flow routes for? In, in terms of an, uh, like an absolute value? Well, in terms of a general return period, like what sort of window are we talking? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, in some ways, I'd prefer not to try and fix it yeah. uh, because it's about actually having some flexibility here to uh, be able to go and achieve something, and particularly in a retrofit area. Um, in new development, it, it, we can maybe kind of uh, look at how our topography is and uh, where we want to kind of uh, take flows to. So from a new development perspective, I, f I think it would be easier to actually kind of uh, fix a, a return period if you wanted to actually do that. But within a retrofit area, I think it's far more important that we understand that we can actually do something far more, and it, and it might improve a level of protection, say, from a 1 in 20 to 1 in 50 or 1 in 40, um, which works within the realms of maybe finance uh, and available space. So I think actually having something which is variable uh, probably actually works better than actually fixed. Thank you. Okay. Do, do we have any more? J just on the back of that, Chris, I mean, how, how do we avoid um, exceeding solutions being seen as a cheap and cheerful solution to drainage? Because that was, there was an implication there in the question about that, wasn't there? Mm. No, I mean, it, I think that's a very good point, and, it, and it's something which we wrestled with on the project, uh, to be honest. I think one of, one of the things that we should always at least have is a reasonable level of performance from our drainage sy 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 systems. Uh, as, as, as much as is possible uh, before we then actually get to um, managing uh, exceedance. And in the original guidance, we actually identified some kind of, some, some aims for us to be kind of hitting before uh, you, you, you look to start to actually manage exceedance. So for example, combined sewerage, uh, uh, if a combined sewerage becomes it, exceeded, you may want that at a higher level than maybe a surface water system. Uh, but I think it certainly shouldn't be seen as just the, the absolute cheapest way to actually do it, but we might see it as a phased approach, as, as we have seen with a number of the case studies where it actually provided actually some, some short-term relief while they've actually been looking to, uh, to, to actually uh, build further schemes. Thank you. Uh, is there another question from the floor? Yes, down the front. Uh, Paul, Richard. Richard Ashley, Eco Futures. Um, Chris, you, you presented very clearly the what we would call the minor tweak exceedances. But there's a whole class of interdependent types of exceedance. You mentioned ISA of 31,000. And the need now to start thinking about joining up risk assessment and risk management within urban areas. And obviously, MPPF goes some way towards that because it specifies looking at exceedance. But other organizations like RIBA don't. That there's a complete lack of awareness. That there's a misunderstanding between design, uh, managing with design for our normal standards and what happens during extremes. And that gap in between 
is an area that needs to be built into all of our new infrastructure in the future. But we didn't find any examples of it worldwide, really, did we? I wonder if you want to comment on that. No, we know, I, think, I, I think it's a shame we didn't actually find any um, eg examples. But I would hope that's actually where we're going to slowly, actually, or maybe fastly, uh, move, move, move to, particularly from the new development uh, arena, because we really have the opportunity, and it's far more in our control, uh, to actually do that. I think one of the things that's nice from the case studies we've seen here is that, is that we are in many ways at the forefront of this globally, whereas we've been in some other areas of drainage in recent history, been a little bit on the back foot and sort of following others. I think we genuinely are um, in the vanguard here and, and, and that's encouraging. And on, on that positive point, I'm gonna just stop the discussion on for the moment and move on to our next uh, presentation.